Did you know that the famous gif of a cat riding a rainbow, Nyan Cat, was recently sold by its creator for 300 ether, which is equivalent to nearly $600,000? If you are unfamiliar with cryptocurrencies such as ether and bitcoin and have never heard of the terms digital assets or non-fungible tokens, don't run away quite yet. Today's interview will help you grasp a more tangible idea of what these are. Hello, everyone. You're listening to Her Voice, a podcast from The Choice, the media powered by ESCP Business School and dedicated to decision makers. My name is Lara. And I'm Emily. And we're from The Choice editorial team. Her Voice is guided by one really important mission, to give the mic to women experts whose vision have transcended the competitive world of business, shaking things up for the better. Today, we are joined by Diana Biggs, the CEO of Valor. After an impressive career as HSBC Private Banking's Global Head of Innovation, a role in which she developed her expertise in financial innovation and blockchain, Diana Biggs joined Valor as CEO at the start of 2021. Valor is one of the most innovative providers for exchange-traded financial products, ETPs. Their mission is to create the most accessible way to invest in innovations, like digital assets. Thank you so much for joining us on Her Voice. As an early thought leader and expert on digital innovation in finance, we are not short of questions we'd like to ask you. It seems that these topics have been in the media almost every day for the last few months. But before we get into the technical side of things, we'd like to know more about you. Can you tell us about the woman behind The Voice? Firstly, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, my career path definitely is not straightforward. Um, I would say that it's it's spanned in a number of different areas. It's probably uh, because of my interest in maybe too many different things or trying to do too many different things at once. Um, but in any case, it has led me to my current role as CEO of at Valor, where we are issuing exchange traded products based on digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, very much a topic in the news and happy to dive into that more. I started working in technology actually in the early 90s. Um, in my high school, they had a co-op program where you could start um, gaining professional experience. I, I started at, at 14 actually because I had been using computers since I was really little and had gotten access to the early internet. This is before there was a web and there weren't many people at that point in time who were familiar with the internet overall. Um, and, the, and the web sort of was just emerging and companies were looking for ways to use that. Most of them by creating internet sites, which were their internal internet sites. And so that was actually my first job. The internet landscape was a very different thing back then. It was really about just getting websites. Usually they were built with things like Flash and yeah, creating flashing GIFs that are now worth six hundred thousand dollars worth of ether, apparently. So that's really interesting. Um, and I and I suppose it's from that experience of being on the internet when things were really early, when nobody really knew what you were talking about, and thought it was a crazy thing that wouldn't kick off um, at all. And then seeing that transition into something that was just absolutely normal, and nobody remembers ever having said that it was a crazy idea that they weren't really interested in at the time. Um, is, is very similar to the experience that I've had in the cryptocurrency space. It was really mainly the Bitcoin space at that time with some other emerging projects. Um, I thought this, this is something that's really interesting and could really be important. And the overall energy reminded me of those early days of, of the internet where it was really you know, technologists who were sort of fascinated in the, the opportunities and the possibilities and in building those out. Yeah, so I guess we could say you're one of the the OG in terms of Bitcoin back when we first started hearing about it. Before diving into the questions we are eager to ask you, we want to make sure we're all on the same page on what exactly is blockchain and Bitcoin. As you explain in your 2017 TEDx talk, blockchain is a distributed immutable ledger. Now, if I summarize this correctly, Basically, we can imagine it as a record book that records every transaction being made, gives a unique code to each transaction so they cannot be changed, and shares it among all participants. 
It's also the technology underlying the digital currency, Bitcoin. We first heard of Bitcoin in 2008 when someone by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto published a white paper titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. The thing that was different about that white paper than there, there were digital forms of cash in the past. There was attempts at, at digital money and there was things like e-cash. There was the Liberty Reserve. There was like, a, there were a few projects um, in the nineties or earlier where people were trying to make digital money. But the, the issue was that there was always the possibility to double spend that money unless you had a central party who was maintaining track of what money is in whose wallet, like who what belongs to who. And so somebody always had to oversee that. So really one of the, the key innovations of, of what Satoshi did was because of the design of, of the system here, really of the design of that protocol made it so that you couldn't double spend these transactions. And so by solving that, you could have a decentralized form of cryptocurrency that didn't require any, any particular party to be in charge because actually a lot of those other initiatives with electronic money that had been started up where that money wasn't attached to a government were typically always ultimately shut down by the US government. They could be shut down because there was a company that was running them that they could go after. With Bitcoin, it's it's an open network and there's, there's no company, there's no single person or entity in any way that is controlling it. So that means that you can't really shut it down. <laughs> Bitcoin is mostly known as a digital currency, but the application of its technology extends much further and can be used to benefit society. But we'll get into that later. Speaking of digital innovation, now that we know what blockchain and Bitcoin are, we have to ask you about the latest crypto craze, NFTs, the three-letter acronym that has hit popular culture like a tsunami. Earlier this year, Christie sold a digital artwork from the artist known as Beeple for $69 million. And more recently, even McDonald's in France has launched its digital artworks in the form of NFTs. So to make sure we're all on the same page, could you explain what NFT stands for and what it is exactly? Sure. So an NFT is a non-fungible token, uh, and that means that they are not interchangeable. So that means that it's really... Um, a token of uniqueness um, so that you're able to identify something as the, the a single element of, of what it is, but have it be, it, have it be in a, in a digital uh, format. So I think that's, that's the reason really that the most sort of obvious and immediate use case for that type of thing has been artwork, collectible items, things where you would want where it can work as something that's just a, a digital representation and where it could potentially add value to it that it is the only one of its kind. So we actually first saw that a few years ago with the CryptoKitties craze. Mm -hmm. And at the time they were the first thing of this type, but there was others that were in development and development of these things kept, kept going on from there after the, kind of the crypto kitties sort of left the media and then really picked up last year where more brands that have big groups of fans started releasing these types of things and more people were sitting at home or wanting to transact digitally. And those people we were people that were interested in just having that collectible item, not necessarily caring about cryptocurrency or blockchain technology. Um, so it was, it's really been an interesting way to get more people to be using this technology without necessarily having to understand or care about the, the underlying details of it. Whereas until then, it's been, it's been quite niche. People that, that are either really fascinated by that technology or really fascinated by trading and markets and money. Um, so, so NFTs have certainly broaden the, the schema. And I think that they'll definitely play an important role in digital economies and societies going forward. Um, but, and, but right now we're just starting off with 
what is the most obvious use case and getting people sort of used to that concept. I mean, there's always been digital art, but it's just been harder to identify when something is the only um, issuance. So it seems clear that the NFT craze is a phenomenon that is shaking the traditional art and music sectors, with the markets being accessible to anyone ready to spend some ether. And with Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, selling his first tweet ever as an NFT for over $2.9 million. It'd be interesting to take a closer look at the links between fintech and social media. That brings us to the other topic we wanted to talk to you about. And once again, news of the last few months. Uh, 2021 has not spared us any of the excitement that 2020 had. Um, so it's clear that social media... Uh, and online communities have had a relatively important impact on the finance world. Just thinking of Elon Musk, who once again has tweeted on several occasions about Bitcoin, causing a flurry of interest about other cryptocurrencies. Unfortunately, we aren't going to have time to talk about Dogecoin, but this is still such an interesting concept to us. Uh, perhaps at the end, we can ask you a question. But getting back to what happened at the beginning of the year, most importantly, at the end of January, GameStop, an American video game retailer, saw its stock soar with its market value rising from $2 billion to $24 billion within a few days. And this is thanks to the Reddit community, Wall Street Bets, who rallied together encouraging traders to buy GameStop stock. Why do you think they managed to have such an impact? That's, that's just where people live these days, even more so during the pandemic. I mean, for me, it feels pretty normal, but I know that I've been you know, living in online worlds since the early 90s, as I said, um, certainly being part of the crypto community, it's very much about telegram chat rooms and crypto Twitter. It certainly has, you know, it used to be a few thousand of us and it's certainly exploded. And now, you know, people that actually friends of mine that I even met on Twitter, say six or seven years ago now, you know, have hundreds of thousands of followers because that that community in itself has increased because you have gen new generations that that's just the form of communication. That's where they get their news and everybody's stuck at home. So that the amount of people that are turning to, to that are, are even more so. And it's beyond people who are you know, just sharing photos or posting fashion. These are communities that are interested in, in technology and in trading and finance. And there's also been a proliferation of, of fintechs over the last few years that have allowed for them to access other areas. So not just cryptocurrency, but just regular trading. I think that they're starting to see some of the, the issues of why the traditional finance and trading might not be as interesting to them, whereas the cryptocurrency, the blockchain community is super dynamic, is constantly innovating, um, is bringing greater returns, obviously also greater potential losses, but it's it's really about dynamic innovation and, and, and everybody is able to participate. It's not a certain crowd, like you don't have to work at like X trading platform or this certain company like for a lot of these projects they're fully open source and everyone can contribute and be part of the community and take part in in a lot of the different initiatives in the case of gamestop uh, many of those buying shares were actually amateur investors uh, they were using this application called Robinhood, which claims to democratize finance what does this mean exactly democratize finance and maybe you can answer in the same breath more generally how has digital innovation in finance made investing and wealth management more accessible? I think it's just the the idea behind that overall, and certainly the idea behind the digital assets, cryptocurrency. A lot, a lot of the focus has often been on how do we make financial services, how do we make money, and and how do we make this yeah the entire sector and sort of economy is more accessible and more inclusive that's been one narrative at least um and and you won't find everybody in the community focus on that some people um you know simply want to be speculating and trading some people want to are are traders that this is a new asset class and they see it that way i mean it can be viewed in in a lot of different ways depending on what your focus is but certainly with fintechs, I think a lot of them 
you know, came up with their ideas in order to offer a better, more customer focused proposition than we were seeing out of the traditional financial services space out of traditional banks. And there was populations that were not being served um, and that were considered not interesting. Um, and there were just areas of the financial system and sectors overall that were simply not accessible to people who weren't, you know, a larger player. You know, there's been a convergence of, of many different trends there. And I think the, the another another aspect with sort of banks is that and, and money is, is that there's a lot of trust involved or it's been a purposely also an opaque industry and now with so much information more widely available and with more regulations around sort of the rules of, of what's allowed and with people spending more time or being interested in for whatever motivation learning more about these systems of, of money management you know that's also because of economic and political situations happening around the world and that's opened a lot more people up to be interested in looking for these new types of solutions and ways in which the future can be different given all of those types of changes, which are in fact now more possible. Okay, so um, you talked about the, the world of finance not being and investing not being accessible maybe to everyone. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that investing in wealth management have always been uh, rather masculine industries. For example, I remember back in the 90s when my mom got interested in buying and trading stocks. Uh, she was quickly mocked by male brokers who told her that a housewife doesn't, shouldn't be playing with money. So I wonder, in your opinion, uh, with cryptocurrency, have things changed today in, in the world of finance and investing? For women? I would say that they're, they're changing. Um, we're definitely not there yet. Um, mm -hmm. There are not many fem senior females in, in fintechs, just as there aren't many in traditional financial services. You know, and that's a shame. And, and that's something that, that needs to be looked at overall. I think how women are treated as investors, I think that might be more of a problem in the in the western world to be honest um but it certainly it certainly still is and there's a large gap that's that's that essentially wealth managers are missing out on and that that gap is increasing as as women become more and more the the holders of of wealth in the future and there's been a lot of great research around this from you know consultancies like BCG have do quite a bit of work on that and women and in investing. Um, Oliver Wyman Financial Services as well. They've um, released a really a, like a number of reports and it's and it's in the trillions in terms of the amount of money that wealth managers are, are missing out on from ignoring women as as customers really and not serving their needs, which you know essentially are are the same but just need to be maybe communicated differently um mm -hmm. certainly served in a way that's that's respectful which i think from the experience of, of your mother that's something you know that you hear about way too often and which mm -hmm. is simply the case even just going into the bank to open a business bank account or to open any kind of savings account and like being asked why your husband isn't there or like how you do this and and certainly running a company i mean and in in the financial services space, just understanding how you're treated by service providers, by other companies that are working with you. I mean, as CEO and, and having um, like a predominantly male team as well, in emails, some people are just addressing the, the, the males that report to me and not even uh, not even responding to, to me or only wanting to deal with them um, or simply not understanding or asking even I had a candidate recently who had reached out to me cold interested in a position and then I said like okay we could talk and then like asked me if I could send a meeting invite um <laughs> and oh, wow. and I was like okay <laughs> You're already you're already trying to get me to do your like the admin work, and I'm the CEO that you're trying to get hired with. So, it, you know, and these these are people that are coming from these like it's so it's from financial institutions, but also from from startups. I guess I suppose what I'm saying is it's not it's not solely an issue of like oh that's what it's like in in the big banks or it's older men that are acting like that. No, it's it's all ages, and certainly one of the reasons that I had taken a break from the crypto space back in 2017 and actually joined 
um, a large corporation was because I, at the time I was so worn down from, yeah, just like some of, some of those attitudes and I found it really hard and I wanted to work somewhere that had, um, you know, an, an HR department. Of course, that's also naive in itself because how much the HR departments actually help female employees who are in different situations um, or is also something that has really been surprising with a lot of things in, in the news recently too. So there's there's still a lot of change that that needs to be made in terms of how women are treated in their roles in this industry and what opportunities are given to them and the sorts of different expectations that are put on them um, or additional burdens that that wouldn't be so for don't don't seem to be so for for men and also as customers and as investors and the issues that I've also seen with with um, women founders and what they've experienced in their fundraisings um, is just absolutely unbelievable. And the data is there, and the the stories are there. Um, but I I think it's it's yeah it is still a challenge to get people to accept it and to listen to it and to to work to to fix it rather than sort of gaslighting that issue when it comes up. As we were preparing for the podcast, Elon Musk tweeted again. Uh, This time announcing that Tesla will no longer accept Bitcoin payments for their cars because of Bitcoin's environmental impact. This announcement has come around three months after Musk announced that they were going to start accepting Bitcoin. In your words, I was wondering if you could explain why Elon Musk has taken a 180 on Bitcoin. I definitely cannot explain why. Um, I find it really bizarre to be honest um and i'm trying to understand if it's some kind of epic troll um if there's some kind of like hidden uh, motivation and so far i'm i'm coming up blank to be honest um i i don't see how there's any different information from the time that that he first initially made the, the purchase and now um because there isn't <laughs> um and if anything i mean he said that there was an increasing use of fossil fuels i think all, all evidence that we're hearing from actual miners and on the ground is is that that is only decreasing um he also referenced in the tweet that it's increasing by transactions or like transactions number of transactions that's that's independent from the amount of energy that's being used um yeah so it's it's definitely very strange and and one has to wonder what is is driving that if it has to do with like some people have hypothesized that you know for his company he's relying on a lot of government subsidies maybe it was um something about potential impact to those and how the government felt about you know crypto overall or this Obviously, I very much believe in in cryptocurrencies and and think that they they have a, a, a place in the future and then will only continue to to grow. It's it's I also care about the environment very much. Um, essentially, what you're doing with with this mining process of crypto is you're creating money out of energy. So you're going to want to have the cheapest energy, and you're going to actually be able to make a profit with that, no matter where it is in the world. So for some of these renewable energy projects, it's an issue because you need to have the that energy wherever it needs to be used, um, because you can't really transport that, and um, or it's more complicated. And um, yeah, so you can you can put a crypto mining plant anywhere, so and you can make money off it. So that's obviously only going to help the creation of more renewable power sources for the future. And then you have those sources. And then, you know, these are, this is, this is a technology. Those are two areas of technology in cryptocurrency and in, you know, innovation, financial innovation, you have some of the brightest minds in the world. They are obviously going to be constantly improving that technology. And the, and if you look at Moore's law, et cetera, the processing power is, is getting more and more, um, succinct as well. So it just feels like all signs are pointing towards the fact that miners are going to be incentivized to use cleaner energy. It's going to be cheaper. It has to be 
cheap in order for these things to be fueled. And this is giving you a way to make money off the energy, which means investing in renewable power. So despite these recent challenges, do you think cryptocurrency is here to stay? Absolutely. I think we've seen from from having been in it now for what about seven years, like there's been a lot of hiccups, um, you know, and there's always different challenges or different people challenging it or trying to destroy it in whatever way. We've seen a lot of different ways of people trying to do that um, and different powers, um, but, but it, it, it's not going back. Okay, so let's fast forward, say 50 to 100 years. What would you want the finest industry to look like? Maybe to not be there anymore. Maybe to hmm. just be rails like that are sort of, yeah, things that happen in the background based on other parameters and really the the removal of as many intermediaries and middlelands, which seems to be a large part of the financial industry so that it can just be around sort of agreements and automating as much as possible um, and, and having that be fully digital and so accessible to, to anyone. And then people can sort of just select which partners or which systems they want to use um, and come to the agreements in terms of what they need and then not have to worry about it really. But to conclude, you've started to develop this idea a little bit and in finding your voice uh, over the last few years, especially in this space. But could you share with us one piece of advice on finding your voice, especially in a sector that still has work to do when it comes to gender equality? Yeah, I think my, my advice would be to make sure you use it. Um, <laughs> And don't worry about it having to be right or have all the answers um, or fit 100% of the job requirements or even 50%. Um, but definitely just, just get out there and, and use it. And, and through that, you'll, you'll find the way. Thanks for listening to the second episode of Her Voice. A podcast from The Choice, ESCP Business School's media dedicated to inspiring today's and tomorrow's business leaders. The voice you heard today was Diana Biggs, the CEO of Valor and early crypto expert. If you enjoyed this episode, don't hesitate to click the subscribe button or share it on your favorite social platform. Until our next episode, keep an eye on your favorite GIF or meme. Who knows? It could be a pricey piece of art one day.